Hello, it's Eric Strong from Strong Medicine. In today's episode of Intern Crash Course, I'm discussing stroke, specifically focusing on ischemic stroke. Please keep in mind that this topic is huge, and this will be just an intern level discussion that will not cover the nuances of neuroimaging, endovascular neurointerventional procedures, or advanced management issues. With that caveat out of the way, let's start with the etiologies of stroke, which will help to understand the workup and small differences in treatment. Stroke, as it's conventionally defined, has two major subtypes. The majority are ischemic strokes, in which there is an interruption to the normal blood flow to part of the brain, resulting in infarction of neurons, a process which begins within minutes. A minority of strokes are caused by hemorrhage, which can either be intraparenchymal hemorrhage or subarachnoid hemorrhage. Although some physicians don't consider subarachnoid hemorrhage to be a form of stroke, strictly speaking. Either way though, aside from their seriousness and their acuity of onset, hemorrhagic strokes share relatively little with ischemic strokes and won't be discussed more in this specific video. But let's take a closer look at the subtypes of ischemic strokes, of which there are five. Ischemic strokes can be due to large vessel atherosclerosis, most commonly a carotid artery. They can be cardioembolic, in which a thrombus originates in the heart before embolizing into the systemic circulation. This is most commonly due to atrial fibrillation, but other causes include prosthetic heart valves, left ventricular aneurysms, endocarditis, and an acute MI. Ischemic strokes can be lacunar strokes, which are small subcortical infarcts, usually affecting the basal ganglia, pons, and internal capsule. There are a number of rare etiologies that don't really belong in another category, such as carotid artery dissection or severe hypotension, in which strokes can form in these so-called watershed areas between vascular territories, where blood delivery is already relatively low at baseline. And last are cryptogenic strokes. These are strokes that appear to be without clear etiology, even after neuroimaging, an echocardiogram, and rhythm monitoring. When an etiology is eventually identified for a cryptogenic stroke, it might be hypercoagulable state, a patent foramen ovale in which a deep vein thrombosis embolizes, and instead of leading to a pulmonary embolism, the embolus can gain access to the systemic circulation through the PFO, causing a stroke. This phenomenon is called a paradoxical embolism. Finally, some cryptogenic strokes are due to occult AFib, AFib that happens so infrequently that it's not captured on a routine heart monitor. Sometimes occult AFib can be identified on a two-week ambulatory monitor that a patient wears at home, while other times the rhythm is so infrequent that a patient might require an implantable loop recorder to be inserted subcutaneously over the chest where it can remain for months in order to catch it. Moving on to how strokes present, they most often manifest as the rapid onset of specific neurologic deficits. The specific symptoms can be unilateral limb weakness, facial droop, difficulty with speech or comprehension, difficulty ambulating, ataxia, sensory loss, or vertigo. Of these, a rapid onset of any of the first three is most predictive of the presence of a stroke. Rarely, a stroke can present with less focal symptoms, including confusion without focal deficits. Particularly profound strokes can present with coma. While strokes can cause a headache or trigger a seizure, either of these as the only manifestation of a stroke would be highly unusual. Once you've identified a possible stroke, there are five steps to evaluation and treatment. The immediate workup to be completed within the first hour of arrival to the hospital, the acute treatment, referring mainly to reperfusion and blood pressure control, then assessment of the etiology, initiation of physical, occupational, and speech therapy, and last, to assess modifiable risk factors and initiate secondary prevention. I'll go through each of these five steps one at a time. In the emergent, immediate workup of a possible ischemic stroke, you'll want to confirm that diagnosis as the top priority so acquire a non-contrast head CT. Even if the ischemic stroke is either too small or too early to be seen on CT, this will rule out the presence of hemorrhage, as CT has a high negative predictive value for subarachnoid and intraparenchymal hemorrhage. An MRI with MRA 
can certainly do this too, and can also identify regions of ischemia earlier. However, for patients still within the TPA window, which we'll talk about in a minute, learning this additional info up front is not worth the significant extra time required for an MR. You also want to rule out stroke mimics. These include hypoglycemia, seizure with post-ictal paralysis, migraine with aura, hypertensive encephalopathy, and conversion disorder. Of the stroke mimics, all but hypoglycemia can usually be sufficiently ruled out by history and exam alone, which is why a glucose level is the only blood test that's strictly required prior to TPA administration. You want to establish the timing of the stroke by the first onset of symptoms. If the time of onset is uncertain, for example, if the patient wakes up with the deficits already present, the time is assumed to be when the patient was last known to be at their baseline. And you'll need to determine the severity of the stroke using the NIH stroke scale. Here's what the NIH stroke scale looks like. I'm not going to read through it, but the basic idea is that the patient's neurologic function in various domains, such as cognition, language, strength, and coordination, are graded. The higher the score for a specific domain, the more severe the deficit. All the points are then added up, and the higher the overall score, the worse the prognosis. When it comes to acute treatment, the most important consideration is whether the patient is a candidate for reperfusion, either with TPA, which stands for tissue plasminogen activator, or with an invasive procedure called mechanical thrombectomy. I've already mentioned TPA several times, but I haven't yet explained what it is or what it does. TPA is a naturally occurring enzyme that catalyzes the conversion of the inactive plasminogen to active plasmin, which then in turn cleaves fibrin, which is the primary protein at the end of the clotting cascade responsible for blood clots. So in contrast to anticoagulants like heparin, which prevent clots from being formed, TPA rapidly speeds up the degradation of pre-existing clots. This makes TPA helpful in the hours following a stroke, while heparin and other anticoagulants are not. So who is potentially a candidate for TPA? Indications for TPA are a clinical diagnosis of ischemic stroke, a measurable neurologic deficit, an onset of symptoms within 4.5 hours prior to the TPA's administration, unless the patient's age is above 80 or other less common features are present, in which case the onset must be within 3 hours. There are a number of absolute contraindications to TPA, an incomplete list of which is here. There are also some relative contraindications to consider, most notably pregnancy and spontaneously improving symptoms. The goal of emergency departments and stroke teams is for no longer than 60 minutes to elapse between the time a stroke patient arrives at the door and TPAs running through their IV. Unfortunately, only a minority of patients presenting with an ischemic stroke actually receive TPA, most often because too much time has elapsed prior to their arrival to the hospital. Regardless of whether TPA is administered, if symptoms have been present for less than 24 hours, the patient may be a candidate for mechanical thrombectomy, the specific indications of which are beyond the scope of this particular video. And before we move off of TPA, I do want to note that there is some degree of controversy over its effectiveness with neurologists in near universal agreement with the aforementioned indications and with a relatively small but vocal group of predominantly emergency medicine physicians disagreeing. I'll post some links about this controversy in the video description. Beyond reperfusion, there are a few other components to the acute management of ischemic stroke that need to be addressed in the first few hours. Intubation and mechanical ventilation should be undertaken in unconscious patients or in those who are otherwise unable to protect their airway. Blood pressure management is another key issue. While hypertension is a major risk factor for stroke, treating hypertension acutely following a stroke can be detrimental, as the peri-infarct territory, a region known as the ischemic penumbra, may be relying on very high blood pressure to maintain perfusion of at-risk neurons. So we typically tolerate much, much higher blood pressures than normal, what's commonly referred to as permissive hypertension. 
In a patient who will be receiving TPA or who has already received it, the goal systolic blood pressure is 185 or less and diastolic pressure of 110 or less. If no TPA, then the goal SBP is at or lower than 220 and diastolic pressure at or lower than 120 unless another hypertensive emergency is concurrently present such as angina, heart failure, or preeclampsia. If antihypertensive medication is necessary, IV meds are preferred, such as nicardipine, clavidipine, and labetalol. In hypotensive patients, vasopressors to increase blood pressure can be rarely considered, but only if the patient is experiencing additional neurologic deficits attributed to the hypotension. In patients who are on outpatient antihypertensives before the stroke, these can be gently restarted after about 24 hours in most patients. If TPA was given or mechanical thrombectomy performed, it's generally advised to wait at least 24 hours before starting aspirin. Otherwise, aspirin can be started immediately. The early use of anticoagulation, such as heparin, is only potentially indicated in unusual circumstances and is generally avoided even in most cases of cardioembolic strokes. At this point, you can start focusing on the etiology. Obtain an MRI and MRA if it wasn't already performed. This will confirm for you the specific anatomic territory, which you hopefully have already suspected from your exam, and will also give you some idea about the degree of atherosclerosis in the large vessels. While an inpatient, anyone not already known to have AFib should be on telemetry, and if the telemetry remains without AFib during the hospital stay, I'd recommend discharging the patient with an ambulatory ECG monitor for at least two weeks. An echocardiogram should be ordered to examine the heart valves and to look for a ventricular aneurysm. A transthoracic echo is usually sufficient, but if there was a particular concern for clot in the left atrial appendage, a transesophageal echo could be obtained. And be sure to consider rare etiologies if the cause remains elusive. Most of the rare etiologies, such as a carotid artery dissection, endocarditis, or an aneurysm, as mentioned, will be picked up with the aforementioned studies, but some others, such as vasculitis or a hypercoagulable state, require additional testing. However, not every patient with a cryptogenic stroke requires an extensive hypercoag workup or requires 15 autoantibodies looking for an unusual presentation of an autoimmune disease. These tests are expensive and have non-negligible false positive rates, so be thoughtful about it. Next, you want to initiate PT, OT, and speech therapy with your patient. For example, all patients who have suffered from a stroke should have a swallow assessment prior to oral meds or a diet. PT, OT, and speech therapy should be started as soon as the patient is awake and stable enough to safely participate. Due to the logistics of scheduling inpatient therapy assessments, these are most often done on the day following admission, but there's no specific medical reason it can't begin on day one for most patients. A timely initiation of therapy is a critical component to maximizing recovery. The last of the five steps of evaluation and management is to initiate secondary stroke prevention. This will include some form of antithrombotic medication the choice of which is most dependent upon the mechanism of stroke. For all non-cardioembolic ischemic strokes, antiplatelet meds are indicated. Options include aspirin, clopidogrel, known by the brand name of Plavix, a temporary course of aspirin plus clopidogrel, known as dual antiplatelet therapy, followed by the long-term use of just one of those meds, or a combination tablet of aspirin and dipyridamol, known as Agrinox. The decision regarding specific choice of med is nuanced and is a constantly evolving topic for which it's best to consult with a neurologist. Following all cardioembolic strokes, anticoagulation is indicated, meaning either warfarin or a DOAC. Although there are an increasing number of situations being found in which DOACs are likely superior to warfarin, at the present time, it's unknown if this is true among patients post-stroke. The optimal timing to begin anticoagulation is unclear, but most clinicians wait at least three days. The more severe the stroke, the longer the delay. 
up to two weeks, or sometimes even longer. Additional very important risk factors to consider include hypertension, checking a hemoglobin A1c and treating for diabetes if indicated. All patients should be placed on a high intensity statin such as atorvastatin 80 mg independent of baseline LDL. Any stroke patient who is still smoking needs smoking cessation counseling. Regular exercise and maintenance of a healthy BMI are believed to be protective against stroke. And last, patients who have had a minor stroke from large vessel atherosclerosis and who have significant ipsilateral carotid artery stenosis should be offered expedited carotid endarterectomy. In appropriately screened patients, carotid endarterectomy reduces the risk of recurrent stroke.